to systematically recognize when oxidation and reduction have occurred in an organic reaction and get a sense of how much quote unquote oxidation or reduction has occurred, assigning oxidation numbers is a key skill. And you've done this already in introductory chemistry primarily for inorganic reagents. We're gonna learn how to do it for carbons now. The basic idea is actually the same as assigning oxidation number to any atom within any molecular structure. We're gonna push all bonding electrons to more electronegative atoms, imagining each bond as ionic, where the more electronegative partner in the bond actually has both electrons or all electrons in the bond if it's a multiple bond. We then examine the resulting formal charges and that formal charge corresponds to the oxidation number of that atom, that carbon, for example. An oxidation number may be positive or negative and it gives us a very rough and somewhat error prone but still useful sense of the extent, the magnitude, and in particular the sign of charge at that atom in reality. One thing to keep in mind here is that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen and so for each hydrogen that you see linked to a carbon, add negative one. Some texts and some instructors don't do this. I actually didn't in the past, um, but I've sort of had a change of heart for this series of videos. We're gonna count negative one for each hydrogen in assigning oxidation numbers. And this is how it's done in the Klein text in section 12.4 of the third edition, which I'm using. So CX bonds increase the oxidation number of carbon from zero, which it is in, in elemental carbon, right? In something like diamond or graphite, the oxidation number of carbon is zero. So for example, in this alcohol, we've got a negative one from the OH group. We've got a positive one contribution from each hydrogen. This means that, and this corresponds to giving both electrons in the CH bond, for example, to carbon. So that the molecule overall is neutral, this means that the oxidation number of the central carbon is negative two. So we, with respect to the carbon highlighted in red, subtracted one for each of these hydrogens. The hydrogens themselves are in the plus one oxidation state. And we added one for this oxygen, which is actually in the negative two oxidation state with this hydrogen plus one and this carbon getting the other quote unquote plus one. One bond to oxygen means we're going to add one here. So we've got negative three for the three hydrogens, positive one for the oxygen, overall oxidation number is negative two. And it's worth it to pause the video now and see if you can draw kind of a perverse resonance form of this molecule where you push all of the bonding electrons to the more electronegative atom in the bond and see what formal charges you get. Should end up with a formal charge of negative two on that carbon. Now formaldehyde here, this molecule in the middle, well, we've got a negative one contribution to the central carbon from each of these hydrogens. The hydrogens are in the plus one oxidation state themselves, and the oxygen is in the negative two oxidation state. There are two bonds between oxygen and carbon. And so that's going to be a plus two contribution to the carbon itself. So the overall picture here, we've got plus one on this hydrogen, plus one on that hydrogen, and negative two on this oxygen. That means the oxidation number of the carbon atom must be zero since the overall charge of the molecule is again neutral. In a carboxylic acid, well now we've got plus one on this hydrogen, minus two on the carbonyl oxygen, two bonds to the carbon, right? And then minus one for this OH, which has only one bond to the carbon. And so to neutralize everything overall, the central carbon must have an oxidation number of plus two here. So we see that a carboxylic acid and all carboxylic acid derivatives are at a higher oxidation level than aldehydes and ketones. That's an important observation. Carbon metal and carbon hydrogen bonds decrease the oxidation number of carbon. And this gives us a sense of why removing H2 from an alkane to make an alkene or an alkene to make an alkyne corresponds to an oxidation process. So for example here, with three H's and a carbon connected to the central carbon, that central carbon has an oxidation number of negative three plus one for each of the hydrogens meaning that carbon has to have a negative three oxidation number to balance those charges. We ignore the other carbon, by the way, because carbon-carbon bonds are more or less electroneutral, right? Electrons are more or less shared evenly, so we can essentially ignore any bonds to carbon, which is nice. If we lose H2 from this, we get to the alkene in the middle, and now we have two hydrogens, each in the plus one oxidation state, 
leaving the carbon now not negative three, but negative two. So notice that an oxidation has occurred. The oxidation number of that carbon has increased. And finally, in the case of the alkyne, well, it's the same dance again. We lose the elements of H2. Now we've only got one hydrogen linked to that carbon highlighted in red, meaning that carbon is now in the negative one oxidation state. Again, oxidation has occurred. So now that we've seen how to assign oxidation number, you'll note that oxidation always involves an increase in oxidation number, while reduction involves a decrease. So for example, a reaction that involves the conversion of an alkyne into an alkene, a hydrogenation process, which you may have seen before in your Organic Chemistry 1 course, corresponds to reduction. Meanwhile, the conversion of an aldehyde into a carboxylic acid, this corresponds to an oxidation process since the oxidation number at the carbonyl carbon is increasing, going from zero to plus two. Related functional groups that can be interconverted via oxidation or reduction can be put on what's called an oxidation ladder, and carbonyl compounds can be put on an oxidation ladder that's highly useful, with actually carbon dioxide at the top of the heap. Carbon dioxide contains a central carbon with two carbonyl groups, and now that we've seen the carbonyl group, this is actually a highly useful way to think about CO2. Next up, we have the carbonic acid derivatives with two electronegative heteroatoms linked to the carbonyl carbon. Notice this pattern, right? These are more highly oxidized than the carboxylic acid derivatives like the acyl chloride, amide, ester, and anhydride, which only have one heteroatomic group linked to the carbonyl carbon with no electronegative heteroatoms linked to the carbonyl carbon. We're at a lower oxidation level aldehydes and ketones, and then if we have not a CO double bond, but a CO single bond in terms of the alcohols, we're at the bottom. And as we'll see, we can convert, for example, alcohols into ketones or aldehydes through an oxidation process. We can convert aldehydes in particular into carboxylic acid derivatives, and it's even possible in some cases to oxidize a carboxylic acid derivative up to CO2 or a carbonic acid derivative. So we'll see reactions that interconvert these functional groups, and it's useful to think of them as involving moving up or down on the oxidation ladder of carbonyl compounds. Of course, we can also move horizontally on the oxidation ladder, and those correspond to just substitution reactions where we're not changing the oxidation level of the functional group, but we are changing the nature of the functional group. Going, for example, from an ester to an amide. There's no change in oxidation level, but there is a change in the nature of the functional group, and we'll refer to that as functional group interchange, or FGI, when it shows up in synthesis. There's a similar oxidation ladder for alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, with alkanes at the bottom. These are the most reduced hydrocarbons. If we lose H2, we get to an alkene there in the middle, and the most oxidized are alkynes, where we've lost yet another equivalent of H2.